The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello everyone, I'm Jordan Cox and welcome to today's webinar, which is hosted by the Nice Future Initiative. Today's webinar is focused on women and SEM Nice Future Initiative, building the gender inclusive workforce of the future. Before we begin, I'll quickly go over some of the webinar features. For audio, you have two options. You may either listen through your computer or over your telephone. If you choose to listen through your computer, please select the mic and speakers options in the audio pane. If you choose to dial in by phone, please select the telephone option and a box on the right side will display the telephone number and audio pin you should use to dial in. If anyone is having technical difficulties, difficulties contact the contact. Go -To Webinars Help Desk, which is at the number shown on the screen. If you would like to ask a question, we ask that you use the questions pane where you may type in your question. Also, the recording of today's presentation will be added to the YouTube link at the, provided on the website. All right, and today we'll begin uh, we'll, uh, by introducing our uh, moderator. Today, our webinar agenda is centered around a presentation and panel discussion from our expert speakers. Uh, about how the NICE Future Initiatives hopes to collaborate with the SEM to foster a more diverse and gender-inclusive workforce in the nuclear sector around the world, and how the nuclear sector is promoting women to leadership positions and encouraging the next generation of girls and women in STEM. Uh, today, I'll introduce our uh, moderator, Dr. Gabrielle Voigt, and Dr. Voigt will provide an introduction to the panel and moderate some of the questions at the end. Then following the uh, the panel discussion, we'll uh, open it up to, to more questions. Dr. Gabrielle Voigt is the director of uh, Win, Win Global, Women in Nuclear Global. Uh, she is heavily involved in activities concerning gender equality and women's networking and internal and external to the IAEA. And with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Gabrielle Voigt. Hello, everybody. It's my pleasure to also welcome everybody to this webinar. It's a quite new experience for me, so I'm really excited about that option. Uh, actually, I'm the Win Global president, and Win Global is an organization promoting first nuclear applications, nuclear sciences, uh, also in relation to energy production. But also, uh, we are promoting women in a field where women are still underrepresented, specifically in uh, the higher professional categories. Uh, I have worked for 14 years in the IEA and was, as a director, was very active in gender issues, not only there, but in general. And therefore, uh, this webinar is a great option to promote women and give them a chance, show them what career options they have, and simultaneously to promote nuclear energy. So at this, please let me introduce our presenters today. These are six high level uh, people who are involved in nuclear energy at any level. We have Susie Jabarowski from the US Department of Energy. She's a senior advisor and policy and communications uh, uh, advisor in the Office of Nuclear Energy. And she is uh, serving the executive leadership team for two multinational energy organizations. Uh, specifically, she is the Vice Chair of the Clean Energy Education and Empowerment Technology Collaboration, Collaboration Program. So, uh, Susie will talk about the NICE activities, as I understand. Our second pe uh, speaker is Per Anders Riedel, who used to be the former uh, 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 Clean 
Open Energy Education Empowerment Technology Collaboration Program Chair, Vice Chair, and he is now working in the Energy Technology Division in France. I also learned that he was very uh, uh, women in the nuclear energy sector when he was in Sweden. As the third speaker, we have Agneta mm -hmm. Rising. She is known as the Director General of the World Nuclear Association located in the United Kingdoms. Agneta comes from uh, Sweden, where she was active in the Swedish nuclear energy sector. And actually, she is a co-founder and the former pre president of Women in Nuclear Global. And I would like to mention here that Agneta is continuing to support Women in Nuclear Global by providing uh, the, uh, our secretariat and uh, helping us with the website. As the fourth speaker, we have Becky Pleasant in the Nuclear Skills uh, Strategy Group, and she is uh, the Nuclear Skills Lead, consisting uh, actually a collaborative group consisting of organizations across the nuclear uh, sector working with governments, regulator, and trade unions to ensure capacity and capability of the UK's nuclear workforce. As the fifth speaker, we have Jean He Ha from Nuclear Energy Agency in France. She is head of the Division of the Radiological Protection and Human Aspects of Nuclear Safety. And uh, actually, she is very active in international cooperation with the when she was working in the Korea Institute of Nuclear Safety in Kings and uh, specifically in uh, public communication, education and training, which very much relates to our topic today. Finally, our uh, last speaker is Chansi Kandasami. She is from Hitachi Nuclear Energy and actually she is the chair-elect of the UN Wind Steering Committee. Uh, U.S. WIN is one of the largest WIN cha uh, chapters of WIN Global, and I'm very happy to have her with us today to speak. So let me uh, go on to our speaker. And as you know, CEM, the Clean Energy Ministerial, E30 campaign was launched in 2018. And we would like to hear more about from Susie Swarovski about that. Thank you so much. Good morning. I'm honored and, and so excited to be a part of this webinar. And I must say, Dr. White says my last name much better than I say it myself in her native tongue. So thank you so much. Uh, so let me just take a moment to step back and say it's a thrill to be a part of this conversation and this movement this morning that's happening from all over the world. You know, we have people from all around the world participating and listening to this webinar uh, with the goal of talking about how nuclear energy can be a part of a clean energy solution and how there are so many jobs and skills within this industry. And it's the most exciting time because right now, women are at the right place at the right time with the right opportunity to become a part of this emerging exciting field that will help to make a real impact in our world in terms of being able to create clean resilient reliable energy systems so just at the outset i just want to make that statement about how excited i am on behalf of secretary perry at the u.s department of energy and uh our Office of Nuclear Energy. So let me move forward. There's two areas I want to talk about. So we talk about this big picture of emerging opportunities in clean energy systems and the goal of bringing more women into this, this, this area in this industry. Why do we want to do that? Well, number one, it's the right thing to do. Uh, but number two, uh, women bring so much in terms of um, an added ability to look at problems in a different way and at opportunities in a different way. And so I'll talk a little bit about that, but 
how do we do actually do that? There's two different organizations that I want to introduce you to briefly. One is the NICE Future, the Nuclear In Innovation Clean Energy Future Initiative that's part of the Clean Energy Ministerial. And then the other is the Clean Energy Empower Education and Empowerment, also known as C3E. I'll go through both of these organizations quickly so that you know what their goals are and you can have a chance to get to know them and engage with them if you so choose. So first starting off about the NICE Future Initiative. Um, NICE came along back in 2017 when Secretary of Energy Rick Perry in the US Department of Energy went to the Clean Energy Ministerial and, and he came back to our office in Washington DC and said, you know, nuclear really needs to be a part of this conversation. Um, clean energy is important. It's a priority for the world. And nuclear is the largest, biggest power source to have uh, non-emitting energy development. And so realizing that there are strengths in all different areas of clean energy, that renewables, wind, solar, hydro, uh, thermal, other areas have um, strengths and challenges, so does nuclear, but nuclear should be part of the conversation. So he came back to our office, Talk to our staff in the international nuclear area, and they came up with the initiative Clean Energy Future. Right away, our friends in Canada and Japan joined on so that we had three countries together to support the development and launching of the NICE Future Initiative under the Clean Energy Ministerial. That was how it got started. Um, let's see, I'm trying to move my slide forward here. Hang on. I know nobody else can help me do this, so there we go. So the focus areas in the NICE initiative, what is the NICE initiative? Well, first of all, it's got a great acronym, so we know that, but more than that, what does it do? It has four different areas of uh, tasking. The first is to promote in innovative uses of advanced nuclear systems, um, building on what's available, and being able to demonstrate how nuclear can work together side by side with renewables, um, especially the advanced newer nuclear that has the ability to scale up from a complete black start to being able to scale into supporting renewables in the peaks and valleys that we know are a part of that system. And so looking at research and development to try to be able to make that a smooth transition and bringing together that team for a clean energy system that is uh, flexible and smooth. Then secondly, in order to be able, it's not just enough to have research and development, we need to engage decision makers and be able to have a conversation with people who are making the decisions about the clean energy systems all around the world. Finally, Working on the economics, making sure that the economics of the scenario work well is essential because we don't want to have a, a solution that's unattainable financially. So being able to communicate and support the economics of making sure that clean energy systems that can include nuclear as an option are viable financially. And then finally, communicating those. Being able to get the word out about nuclear and it's non-emitting sources of creating electricity. And an exciting thing about nuclear energy in, in our advanced marketplace and, and the designs that are emerging today is that they have a lot of non-energy resources as well. So I won't go into a lot about that, but there are things that nuclear energy can do today that weren't able to be applied in the past as a non-energy source. And what I'm talking about is these advanced reactors can do things like desalinate water, um, provide large heat sources that can help heat a whole city um, or an industrial purpose. Uh, so using that heat transfer for other resources, as well as uh, traditional things like medical isotopes food safety, um, and other non-energy applications are, are really important as well. So moving to the next area, I wanted to give some examples of what that might look like in a clean energy system. So for example, this photo that I'm showing shows you a full complex that includes windmills, uh, advanced nuclear under this top left corner here is the cap where the, the nuclear 
Um, it's a small modular reactor that's located mostly underground. It looks so much different than what we're used to seeing in nuclear. And it's integrated with solar panels and windmills all in the same picture. This rendering I want to just mention is courtesy of Third Way. And each of the following pictures that I want to show are part of the Third Way um, artwork that has created the vision for the future. Here we're looking at a data farm. So this data farm might be somewhere out. You can see it's in the foothills of a mountain. It includes small modular reactors, solar panels, and off in the distance windmills that are powering not just this data field and this data center, but also a small industry um, business area in, off to the right-hand side. So you can see it's integrated solar, wind, and nuclear. Another use that's really important is in Arctic and remote areas. So you can see here we've got an Arctic village that's covered and a small modular reactor is powering that village off in the mountains. There are windmills placed in the mountains that can bring the wind and the nuclear power together in harmony. And um, it's very clean for the environment. It's also very unobtrusive for the environment rather than using um, diesel fuel. And then the final next look is at an industrial capacity where inside this industrial plant, you see nuclear power plants are, are integrated. And, and the way that this can happen in the advanced nuclear world is because there would be a zero emergency planning zone. So you can see that there are people standing right very close by the nuclear reactors because the innovation has created a safety environment where we don't have to have a 10 mile emergency planning zone around the, the nuclear power plant. And therefore it can live very close around people and uh, the community to be able to power manufacturing plants like the one that you see here in this ironworks rendering. So that's a look at what the purpose of the NICE future is. Really the NICE future initiative is to demonstrate how clean energy systems can be built utilizing nuclear as part of the uh, renewable and nuclear together rather than trying to decide on do we want to go with renewables or nuclear. Um, the next area is specifically and focused on how do we then attract women to this area of clean energy. And it's really important because if we look at uh, the 2010 numbers when the STEM was launched, um, there weren't and still are not a lot of women in clean energy fields. So what does clean energy and education and empowerment um, have to do with this? Well, it's all about bringing women into the field. Since 2010 and its inception, there have been 60 distinguished women who have come from all over the world to serve as what we call ambassadors. They're really advocates for helping bring women into the clean energy industry. Uh, also, there has been a transform transformation that's taken place um, into the IEA Technology Collaboration Program because the TCP program is a strong channel for being able to champion causes like this. And the outcome that we're starting to see is shared leadership um, between Sweden, Italy, and Canada that started the, the C3E initiative and now has built to a force of nine different countries coming together all in support of women in clean energy. Um, I'm cognizant of my time, so I don't want to take up too much time, but um, we'll, we'll move to the next slide and talk about what it is that C3E does. There we go. Um, we, we collect data and recognize that uh, just 35% of the renewable energy uh, workforce is 35% women. And compared to traditional energy, which is only 20%, that's more, but it's still not a great number. And looking at, this is incongruent with, there's women are basically underrepresented in a field where the job potential is so high, up from 9.8 million jobs up to 24 million jobs projected for the year 2030. In fact, the Kinsey Group, um, if we look at their, uh, whoops, I do not want to leave the webinar. We look at their data. Uh, they estimate that advancing women's equality could add 12 trillion to annual GDP by 2025. And at the end of the day, there are a lot of 
um, data and um, estimates that can show our different outcomes that can come as a result of bringing more women into the field. But we know that women bring creative solutions and we know that women bring a new aspect of decision making and um, creativity to solutions like this. So it's in addition to the numbers that can be estimated to for GDP and things like that, um, it's the right thing to do to bring women into a, a growing industry like clean energy. And so there are a lot of accomplishments that have happened out of C3E, clean energy education and empowerment. We're continuing to move forward, but the four work streams are we collect data. So it's really important to be able to benchmark where were we in terms of having women represented in the clean energy field and having the data behind that so we can show if we're making progress or not. Then we have ambassadors. These are really mentors who are pulled from around the world, women of all different areas, levels in their career, different um, energy sources to be mentors, to bringing younger women in, helping them to find internships, helping them to find scholarships, helping to demonstrate as a role model what it's like to work in the clean energy field, then being able to communicate it in an organized way so that people can see how women are contributing in the clean energy field. And finally, a robust awards program where we'll be giving out awards for both an individual and a company that's making a contribution for women in clean energy at next month's clean energy ministerial. So that's a snapshot of the NICE initiative that's looking at clean energy systems broadly and the C3E initiative that is working actively to bring women into this clean energy field that's growing every day and contributing to our world. So thank you, Dr. White. I will turn it back to you and be available to questions at the end. Thank you very much, Susie. I think you gave an excellent overview of actually also how it can look like to have clean energy uh, in application, even for producing uh, not only uh, support to human house, food and agriculture, but also to improve our living standards we want to adhere and do not want to give up. So uh, our next speaker is Pierre Anders uh, from France, who will speak about uh, the advancing gender equality in clean energy. Please, Pierre Anders, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Dr. Voigt. And um, Susie, it's a great pleasure to be part of this webinar and have the opportunity to speak both with uh, my former role, uh, in the form, my former role as the the vice chair of uh, the C3 Exco, but also uh, my past experience at working with gender in the Swedish government. Uh, today I'm working at IA and I will be continue supporting the C3 initiative, which I'm very pleased about. So I plan to to, to do my intervention in uh, building on, on, on three blocks. So first of all, going back to a question, why is gender issues important for the future of the energy sector? Uh, an important question which we should not forget to ask uh, as we go through and look at what actions we want to take. The second thing I want to raise and inform you about is uh, the Clean Energy Ministerial as a platform for uh, working together between countries on accelerating the clean energy transitions. And, and finally, uh, I will not say many words on C3 because this is already cover most of it very well, so, but I will speak particularly one of the initiatives under C3, which I also want to invite you all, uh, you and your organizations to join. So first of all, let me say a few words on why this is an important topic for energy ministers, for energy ministries, for companies. Well, it's not only about uh, having equal opportunities to shape our societies and our future. Uh, this is extremely important as well, of course, but it's also important for the energy sector to realize that uh, gender, uh, increasing the, the gender balance in the energy sector will be a strategic issue for the future. Looking at today, uh, there are many, many studies showing the value of uh, more diverse organizations linked to innovation, to progress, uh, and creativity, but also, and not in particular, I would say also, the nuclear sector is a challenge of uh, 
ensuring the right human capacity. And this is not only the energy sector or the nuclear sector, it's across the society. In many sectors, there's now a challenge to find the right uh, skills. Before leaving my job in, in Sweden for this job, we had a enhanced discussion with the industry on this particular topic. So looking at not only at this as a, uh, from a fairness point of view, but looking at as a crucial topic for the future of the energy sector. So if we want to achieve our long-term objectives to 2040 of low, car low, car low carbon neutrality or uh, high shares of um, uh, well, renewables or, or whatever target you set, should there be a component of looking at skills as well, human capacity? And this is something I believe a strong message from the industry that this is important. Because the Minister of Education, they have their priorities, but Minister of Energy should probably also have a look at this topic. So why is then, uh, sorry, so why is then SAM uh, Clean Energy Ministry a useful platform for these kind of discussions? Well, for the ones that don't know SAM, it uh, gathers about 20, 25 major countries in the world that are either uh, big economies or for in the forefront when it comes to clean energy solutions. These are countries which have uh, a number of existing challenges in their home countries and realizing that working together will help also uh, the domestic uh, priorities. So uh, it has been, as Susie mentioned, for about 10 years. Uh, this year, in about the month, we gather for a very exciting event in Vancouver, Canada. And we're very happy from the IA's perspective as well to see the progress of the NICE uh, initiative, which we're also now planning uh, to launch a report on uh, future scenarios for nuclear. nuclear uh, as well as having activities on gender and energy in, in Vancouver. But following this platform for some number of years, I think, again, um, there's a number of things you cannot do on a domestic level, which makes sense to work on an international level. Data collection being one. So what do we measure? Uh, why do we measure it? And uh, how do other countries measure things? And this can definitely help us as well to feed in information to future uh, policy decisions uh, in our ministries. I will not spend that much time more on speaking on these different components of C3 because they've already been mentioned by, by SUSI, but I want to spend my last uh, minutes speaking about the initiative Equal by 30. So this comes back to, come back to, to a number of ministerial meetings uh, from IA ministerial in 2017 to the Clean Energy Ministerial in Beijing and, and last year as well in, in Copenhagen and Malmo. There's a lot of uh, recognition about the importance of women in energy or gender diversity in general. Uh, so a lot of support both from the highest level in government but also in the private sector. But how do we do take it to the next level? How do we, how do we say, okay, this are the objectives, but how do we get there? So this is what Equal by 30 is all about. So this was launched uh, uh, last year in Copenhagen at the ministerial by a number of our ministers. This was followed up by uh, a G7 meeting in, uh, in Canada this summer, where a number of other countries uh, joined uh, this, this call or uh, campaign, as we call it. And you will see in my next slide the number of uh, signatories that has actually signed up to this uh, call. So in Equal by 30, we are saying that, of course, we want equal opportunities, equal leadership, equal pay to 2030. Um, but then also we have, uh, we have drafted a number of high-level principles that all the signatories have to uh, sign on to. But the next step and the really crucial thing about this campaign uh, and where I invite you all and your organizations to join is to explain and show us what are you doing in practice? So what are your internal policies to actually support the objective of equal by 30? In the Swedish government, uh, in the past role, we, of course, if you go into this website uh, where we can see all the signatories, you can also click on the Swedish flag and you'll see what we commit to. So these are the principles that are guiding for our government's work. But in that discussion, that will help us for two, two reasons. One reason is it will 
will help us to understand what is the gap. I mean, we do are we doing enough? And this is, of course, important both from uh, thinking about new policies and again looking at other countries what they are doing or other companies as some of these issues are internal policies. But showing more visibility on what your organization is actually doing doesn't only help uh, sharing ideas to others how you can approach this challenge, but it does also uh, put some internal pressure of actually not only uh, do the talk but also do the walk. So you, this is the this is why this initiative is is, is very exciting. So I think I want to stop there and um, I will definitely again invite you all to uh, to join this campaign and. What you do is the first step is really look at those overarching principles if you can subscribe to them. Uh, you just send an email to uh, the email we have on the website. I'm sorry I didn't have it here, but it should be on the website. Um, but then really uh, the next step is to start looking at what you actually do and put that on the website too so we can show each other what we're trying to do. And this is on an international level or on a domestic level of very much value to understand better how we actually can shift the discussion from that this is something important for the future to actually what policy actions we could take to accelerate the progress on gender diversity in the nuclear and energy sector. So I think I stopped there and unfortunately I cannot stay to the end so but I agree to take any written questions I'm happy to answer uh, after the call as well. So thank you very much. Thank you, Per Anders. It's great uh, to hear about this initiative. I actually would love to see the IEA to be also a signatory of this. And I will do my and need and actually use my connection still existing uh, to, to get you the Can IEA. The IEA. Hello? Hello? Yeah, so if I can yes. So that's that's very super, I mean that's a good uh, good uh, input and I think uh, I didn't mention that because I focused on the campaign but the IA is now um, we are also doing uh, uh, we're going to plan to do a lot more on this topic so we have a ministerial meeting in mm -hmm. November uh, we're planning a side event but again coming back to the most important question what can we do yeah we can get better data better information that can help policy decisions in the future. And this is something we will focus on now in 2019. Uh, mm -hmm. That's broadly speaking, the energy sector. Okay, thank you. I hope to see you at the IEA General Conference, uh, maybe uh, during a side event where you can also talk about NICE and what's going on uh, in your initiative. Uh, our next speaker is Agneta. She is joining from Turkey, as I understand, and I hope the connection will be good enough to give her our ideas uh, about NICE and uh, gender issues in the nuclear energy section. Agneta, please come and join us. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Gabi, and uh, all the others. I hear a lot of enthusiasm and a lot of excitement and a lot of energy. So I think uh, we are already on track to solve uh, some of these uh, uh, talent issues we have that we really need to work on. I'm happy to join you all here uh, from, from uh, our World Nuclear University course that we are right now having in Istanbul in Turkey. And, uh, I, just to say that I started in Sweden a long time ago and uh, I had been experiencing uh, working like the only woman in a totally male dominated environment, uh, but also how it was how it was possible to change once you could have one or two or even three women in a team, you can really change a lot of things and have an impact on the strategies and also what is done. So I love to do is to uh, to uh, to drive change and uh, not so much to talk about things though I talk a lot but uh, to really drive change 
And uh, I'd like to go back also to the role I had with the, uh, sometimes with the Swedish government or with the EU Commission or even the IAEA. When I went, stepped out of Sweden into the other countries, it was even worse. There was absolutely no women. So uh, I, I at least could use some of my experience from Sweden and then see how that would, could be applied in many other uh, areas. One important thing is al already mentioned in the beginning, in January 1990, we had the first network meeting of women and nuclear energy only in with the European uh, countries. And that was uh, the start of the venture that resulted in uh, the creation, uh, creation of women in nuclear. And I, I was chairing that very first meeting and it was a fantastic thing to have all these women in the room on the front lines. And then the men were sitting in the back of the room because they were very curious what we were going to talk about. So that was a very special experience from the 1990. I think we have come uh, very far. And uh, when we started WIN, uh, I mean, the idea with the whole network and then the women in nuclear was that we need women. We need women to talk to uh, also the general public. So the start was that professional women that have a profession or an occupa occupation in, uh, in like say radiation uh, technology, some kind, maybe uh, medicine, maybe they do something in agriculture with radiation technologies, maybe uranium mining, maybe uh, operator of a nuclear plant. These women that have a profession, if they reach out to the general public, they could answer the questions that is out there, to build transparency, to build the openness and to uh, answer the questions that come from the lay audience. So this is how we started. We wanted to do this. Then we had a lot of spin-off. And I think with this C C3 program, you will have a lot of spin-offs as well. So the spin-off we got, we got the visibility of the women, because once you see them and start to put them together, you see there are women. Because sometimes people say there are no women, there's no they don't have any qualifications. We cannot recruit them to higher levels. They are not there. They are, there, there is no women, a lot of men would say. But once we started to put the women together and they were given the space to speak or to do things, they became visible. And when they became visible, their career developed. And then they became also mentors. They became role models and more women came in. So that's, uh, that's a very good circle. So, so we have now women that are like ambassadors for this. We have also sponsors. I, I myself like a sponsor for, for a lot of development with, uh, with women included. And uh, this is important, how we have been working with this. And then that's one part I wanted to talk about uh, all the experience we have in WIN and which we can build on and uh, do even more. But then also, we have in the global nuclear industry set the harmony goal. And that means we need to use all clean energy sources together. We have to work together and we have to work in a reliable and in flexible way, but all clean energy sources are needed for the future. Otherwise we have no sustainable energy future. And we see all these wonderful technologies uh, which I mentioned a few, um, medical uh, radiation, me medicine, the treatment, and also how you preserve the crops and how you can uh, increase uh, the yield on, on, uh, on the fields uh, and then have more food coming from the same area, uh, from the same space. And that means uh, there is many technologies and we need more and more women into these areas. So we need to show uh, how fantastic the jobs are. We need to have education already from lower levels, because if you don't have female teachers, it will be hard to get uh, uh, women coming into the STEM areas. So we need to look through the whole chain. But with the harmony goal that we have set with 25% nuclear in the year 2050, and working together with the other clean energy technologies, has been an important step for the global nuclear community. That means we see ourselves together with uh, the clean energy technologies and we see how we can work together. So this is the basis of all. 
And uh, this working together is, I think, the same with energy sources, is the same as with diversity you need in the, in the workforce, in the talent. Uh, so this is uh, what I've been also doing on a small scale in the Secretariat of the World Nuclear Association. We have 50-50 uh, uh, men, women uh, in the office. If I look to the management team, it is as many female managers as male managers. And if I would look to the salary, I think I need to decrease the salaries of the women because they have in fact higher salaries than the men uh, in my management team. And they don't know it, but <laughs> now they know maybe if they listen. So the, that is also important to show yourself in your own team how you do this. The next step we have also been doing is to have um, in every print material and also on our website, I made a big change. First of all, on pictures, it should be half of it should be technology and the other half should be people. And among people, one half should be men and the other half should be women. So we need to set the example. We need to put the pictures there. We need to be attractive, but also uh, more women coming in. And we need more women coming because we want the best talents for having a successful, sustainable energy future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Agneta. I think you gave us actually concrete examples uh, how you can change uh, an organization. And what we need really is organizational change in the different institutions. And of, you have to start with small steps, which then will elaborate further and further and really make the change on the large scale. Thank you very much, Agneta. Our next speaker is Becky Pleasant, and she will, she will share with us experience in the United Kingdom. Becky, please. Good afternoon. Thank you very much uh, for the invitation to speak uh, on this really exciting seminar. Um, I'm going to be talking a little bit about the face of the nuclear sector in the UK um, and, and what we need to do to really um, take the next step between talking and, and, and actually acting in, in this space. Um, my name is Becky Pleasant. I am head of skills for a group called the Nuclear Skills Strategy Group, which I'll talk a little bit more about in, in my presentation, but effectively we're representing the nuclear sector in the UK. So I'm just trying to change, there we go. So um, the first point to make um, is the background to uh, where we're at with our diversity um, targets uh, in the UK. Um, and I guess the background to it in the UK is our industrial strategy um, and something called the nuclear sector deal. So our UK uh, industrial strategy in 2017 uh, very much focused on the need to create an economy that was providing greater productivity and earning power throughout the UK. And that's kind of a, an important hook for our positioning of nuclear um, in, in the UK, that that earning power, that earning potential should be equal for all. Uh, this strategy also set out a clean growth challenge, um, which, which looked at emphasising and maximising the, the, the advantages um, for the UK um, as we shift from um, a, a sort of higher carbon to cleaner carbon energy growth uh, sector. Um, and within that then, uh, we created, or the government created with industry, a sector deal to position the nuclear sector as strongly as possible to uh, effectively boost our productivity and um, reduce the costs of nuclear uh, and get us on, on track to um, being able to export uh, our nuclear potential across the world as well. Um, quite ambitious target. Um, quite ambitious strategy um, and a recognition most importantly that all of this is only going to be delivered um, through our people and um, that, that effectively the nuclear industry is nothing without its people. 
So just moving on then, um, within the sector deal, um, uh, uh, there are some quite specific targets that industry and government have signed up to together. And these are important because it's really set the conversation, set the um, cooperation, I guess, between industry um, and government. Um, and there are probably four key ones that it's worth talking about. Um, there's the, uh, the first is about uh, actually reducing our cost of nuclear new build. So we're looking to reduce the cost of nuclear new build in the UK by 30% through the nuclear sector deal. We're looking at generating savings of up to 20% in decommissioning um, activities in, in the UK and increasing our domestic and international contracts by, uh, by up to two, 2 billion by 2030. And the fourth one, the one that's most relevant to this particular seminar, um, is that we've also committed publicly um, to a 40% women in nuclear target by 2030. You might argue why not 50%, but we'll uh, we'll explore that in a little bit uh, uh, more detail as we start to look at some of the data. Um, but actually, it's important to recognise that all of those four targets require us to do and act very differently in the nuclear sector in the UK than we have done previously. We can't carry on doing what we've always done um, and assume that we'll just create those um, or, or, or achieve those, those particular targets. So we have to think and do things differently. And that's where women come in, uh, in our belief. In fact, it's not just women, it's diversity of people generally diversity of, of, of people creates diversity of thought and that then leads to um, productivity increases through innovation and that's really been the kind of commercial focus of of our activities in the UK and why we're um, so passionate and and you know on top of the moral and, and uh, ethical argument about why we should be increasing uh, women in nuclear there's also this commercially driven argument as well so the NSSG um, uh, have been tasked to deliver the people elements of that nuclear sector deal target um, uh, and, and so particularly the 40% women in nuclear along with some other targets sit with us um, as at, at the NSSG. The NSSG are a cooperation of, of all major employers involved with nuclear in the UK, both um, at the kind of uh, owner operator level and the supply chain um, as well. It works with government, so government sit on the NSSG as do regulators and trade unions, um, so that we're truly representing the sector. Um, both um, governmental and, and on the industry side. And we've got a broader remit than just um, achieving the 40% women in, in, in nuclear. I mean, most importantly, we need to make sure that we have um, and can meet the, the, the people to, 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 um, to deliver the, the sort of 100,000 100, um, skilled jobs that, that the nuclear sector will need going forward. Um, but, but it does include a more diverse workforce, um, as I said, including the 40% female representation um, uh, by, by 2030. We've got other aspects about growing our subject matter expertise um, in the UK um, to replace retirees, which um, uh, are, we've actually got quite an aging demographic in the UK. So we need to make sure we've got a replacement um, of those people. Um, and we also recognise that we need to um, increase the mobility of people across um, our sector and actually from other sectors to our sector as well, because that also brings in a diversity of thought that we've probably been lacking in the past. And finally, the piece around attracting new people into the nuclear sector has already been mentioned on this seminar, but vitally important that we've got um, the kind of um, people to um, draw from uh, into the nuclear sector, um, people who are um, taking the right subjects to be um, uh, kind of uh, able to interact with the nuclear sector. So um, our ambition in the NSSG is to work um, collaboratively with industry and government and trade unions. Um, we've, be put, we've decided to put diversity at the heart of our commitments and have agreed some very challenging diversity targets. Um, actually, we had a lot of conversation, a lot of challenge around whether we should go public on some of these targets, but we decided that if we were serious and committed to the diversity um, aspiration, then we had to 
put these numbers out in the public domain and then uh, work out how we were going to deliver against them. So as well as the 40% women in nuclear, we've committed to um, uh, reaching a 50% participation in apprenticeships, one of the routes through um, through into our sector, which has probably been negatively affecting our um, gender uh, participation in the sector to now. So um, uh, a participation in apprenticeships in nuclear has been less than um, what that, that which we achieve in, in, in other attraction campaigns. Um, and importantly, uh, recognition that we want that representation of women at all levels um, of our business. So 25% of senior management roles to be held by women. Again, you know, you, you always end up with a debate with these targets about whether you've gone far enough or whether you've gone too far. And we've, we've, we've pitched this as, as being ambitious, but realistic, given the, the starting point of our sector in the UK at the moment. So where are we now? Um, we currently um, have a workforce, which I guess is true of the UK, uh, of the world, actually, that is 51% um, female, um, but only 22% of our workforce are female. Um, and this is important for two reasons. Uh, not only, you know, if we're needing to increase more people into the sector, then we're missing out a chunk of, of people that we could uh, readily tap into. But we're also missing out um, of uh, the... Um, different characteristics, the different traits that we're able to um, uh, benefit from by, by increasing the diversity of our, um, of our workforce. And although our conversion rate from female, female applicants to female recruits is pretty good, we do struggle to, to get women to, um, uh, you know, kind of apply to the sector in the first place. Um, and, and then when they are there to, to retain them. So those are two particularly important focus areas for the work that we're doing. So what have we done so far? And I think it is important to recognise that in, in talking to this seminar today, we absolutely aren't holding ourselves as the, uh, the, the best in class. We're here to learn. We're here to share what we're doing, but importantly, um, you know, to learn from other countries, from other sectors, from whoever's prepared to um, uh, exchange their views with us on this. And there's uh, a long way um, we've got to go. But we have started that journey. We've started that transition from words to action. Um, and the first thing we've done is to develop um, a, an equality, diversity and inclusivity strategy for the whole sector. One strategy that the whole sector, all of the industries within the sector and government and, and trade unions and um, regulators have all signed up to, which, which have a, a number of elements to, to it, but includes a, a, an ability to measure your own organization from a maturity perspective against a, a series of dimensions which which reflect how diverse and um, open you are to people from from a range of different um, aspects but including uh, women uh, so that that's been the first piece and again you might argue that's just a written document that's not showing a commitment but actually in signing up to this strategy the companies are also committing to act on the back of that as well, um, we immediately established a sector-wide sharing forum um, to, well, in fact, a number of fora for, uh, um, in, in, uh, representing a range of different diversity characteristics. But um, these are just a, a way of sharing good practice, sharing what's already happening or sharing the barriers and problems that people are um, exploring, uh, uh, that are experiencing at the moment and, and coming up with some solutions to it. We've um, Oh, it's interesting. One of the well, the first two presenters talked about monitoring, measure, and measurement. These are really important to us, recognizing where we're at now. And it's not just that um, high-level 22% versus 40% statistic, but it's how that breaks down in terms of the different levels of roles, the different. Um, types of occupations, uh, the different uh, types of, of, of organizations within our sector. Are we all um, doing our part towards that, that equality uh, aspect or are there pockets of, of difficulties that we need to address? But importantly as well, it's about celebrating progress and we do see um, uh, developments. Now, we've only really been on this, this journey for uh, you know, officially under this this remit for, for about six months or so. So we've not yet been able to um, promote and celebrate progress, but we're hoping to do so um, in the not too distant future. 
We've also signed up as a sector, and again, this is nationally, every organisation um, on the NSSG have signed up to committing to the Future Board Scheme. This is about increasing participation of females on, uh, in, on, on boards in companies um, through mentoring and through observational um, capacities, allowing people to, to sit on boards and develop the experience, which will then enable them to um, to be more successful in, in actually applying for those roles in the future. Um, and importantly, we, what we've recognised is that, that um, this, this focus on women into nuclear can't just be an add-on activity um, with, with a person responsible for it. It has to be embedded throughout all of the delivery themes of the work that we're doing. So we have five themes that we, we um, are focusing on. Um, it starts with leadership, it looks at apprenticeships, it looks at that higher level skills, it looks at how we attract people in from other sectors and how we attract people in from schools and colleges. And we're um, tasking each of the leaders for each of those areas to have the diversity and, and, and female focus at the core of what they do. So that as well as being um, uh, some, some specific activities that sit outside of, um, of our program, there are also a huge number of, of, of activities that are embedded in those programs. So for instance, if I just pick through a couple of these, under the exciting the next generation about nuclear, which is a, a, a kind of a program of activities that look at how we engage with schools and colleges uh, and focus on um, apprenticeships and, and that kind of thing. We're, we're looking at specific bespoke programs um, that, that encourage um, fit females um, into sciences. We recognise that physics particularly is particularly badly represented by, by women in the UK. So what can we do to make physics more attractive um, for, for females? Um, do we need to incentivise um, apprenticeships, uh, female apprenticeships? Do we need to actually encourage organisations to take on more a greater proportion of females into apprenticeships by um, supporting the contribution financially, um, supporting their contribution to, to, to salary to encourage them to do that as a short term measure? We've looked at some um, development schemes for mid-career professionals, so recognising that sometimes people get out of the uh, um, work, working market if they take career breaks for children or whatever, how do we help and support them back into the sector um, subsequently? So a number of different um, initiatives that, that kind of cross the, 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 the range of themes that we're um, uh, involved with anyway, so it's absolutely embedded in, embedding it in the core. So just in summary, we've, um, you know, what, what we've done is to make sure that what we're doing with gender diversity is absolutely embedded into the UK's industrial strategy, so the two are aligned, that the, the issue is owned by um, government, industry, trade unions, regulators alike, it's one, one issue that we're all working together on, um, that, it, that it is in, integrated throughout the, the range of things that we're already working on to, to attract a future workforce into the UK. It's not a tag on, it's, it's embedded in, into everything. And, and being you know, absolutely clear that we're, um, we've got a long journey, we've got a long, long way to go. Um, we've got a lot that we can learn from other sectors, from other countries. We need to be receptive and open to that. So for every good initiative that I might have talked about, I'm sure there's a million others out there from um, uh, people on, on this seminar that, that, that we could benefit from. So let's, let's talk and share. Um, and, and the last point, I guess, in summary, is just about that having that um, challenging target. We had a number of conversations about whether or not we should have a 40% women in nuclear target. There is a, um, you know, some nervousness about targeting in this space. Um, but it, um, you know, in hindsight, you know, for, like I guess, say, it's about six months in. I'm so pleased we have, you know, it has um, instigated so many more conversations, so much more discussion than, than the gender uh, issue would have done had we not had the, um, the target that, that I, I don't think we would have, have made as much progress without it. So I'll pause there and um, pass, pass on to, to the next presenter. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Becky. Uh, very interesting, your targets specifically. I'm quite curious to see how uh, fast and rapid you will uh, approach those. 
Uh, actually, you mentioned a very important point, and this is recruit, recruiting the future generation. And you might be aware that there is the young nuclear generation, which provides a pool of experts uh, ready to be employed. So just to keep that in mind, uh, and I think we will have more during the questions and answer uh, section on that. But with this, I would like to continue with Chehon uh, Hihaf from uh, NEA in Paris. We know each other very well, and uh, I think it's great to meet via the webinar again. So, Chehon Ha, please take the floor. Thank you very much, Gabby, for your kind introduction, and thank you uh, for other colleagues. Thank you for inviting me to this uh, important webinar. My name is Yoni Ha. I'm the head of a division of radiological protection and human aspect of nuclear safety of OECD Nuclear Energy Agency. I'm very pleased to introduce any activities in gender equality, uh, focusing on international mentoring workshop in science and engineering. Okay, so uh, the many countries have made efforts to address the lack of female representation and leadership position in technical fields. Despite this effort, the progress has been slow. This is particularly true because the number of students who major in science and engineering are still low compared to the number of girls who study in education and humanities, as you see in the table. So one of the so when we organized uh, the mentoring workshop, we look at the reason why we still have uh, the low number of leadership in position. First, we know that the few people, a low number of ladies are studying in science and uh, engineering. And even the goal study STEM areas, there are many challenging barriers when they are working in the work field. So normally we just call it a leaky pipeline. As you see this OECD table, major challenging factors are general norms and cultural practices, which are more, more favorable to men normally. And another factor we had need to pay attention to is lack of role models. So in order to address these challenges, uh, the NEA decided to have an uh, international mentoring workshop targeting at high school girls and junior school girls to encourage them to uh, the study in STEM areas. So the main concept of mentoring workshop is to uh, have the students to be connected to highly accomplished female mentors. As you see in the pictures, maybe some of you can recognize one man in the center, the DG Magud of NEA. Actually, he uh, the suggested this uh, the gender uh, equality initiative through the mentoring workshop. So the DG Magud supported, supported this workshop very well. And actually, we feel very lucky to work with him because we have very good supportive of uh, the people and higher uh, senior management here and we had the video uh the the messages from uh ellen langjivang jolio i believe gabby and uh agneta you remember her because she spoke at the one of the win global conference which was held in paris at the time also i met her in person um but she provide us with really, really good messages. As you know, that she is a, uh, the Mara, Madame Curie's granddaughter. Uh, anyone who is interested in seeing this video, just to visit uh, the YouTube and type OECD NEA, and you can find this, uh, the Madame Langji Bang Julius, the messages. This, her message was really uh, encouraging and inspiring for young girls. Well, we had after the first workshop in Japan, we had a second workshop also in Japan last year. Um, there are many uh, the related photos I will not go in detail, but one of the sessions I really want to highlight is parents and teachers session. Because after having the first mentoring workshop, we realized that the real mentor in goals daily life uh, is 
either parents or teachers. So we learned that um, they should, the teachers and parents should know that they are um, the the role and men, well role in their, their daily life um, influencing them and I mean girls to have some um, idea about uh, studying STEM areas. Normally gender stereotyping or gender bias are often generated by either their parents and teachers. So we invited them to have a interaction with us and then it was excellent, excellent opportunity for us to meet them and to listen to them and they were also very open and very um, uh, energetic uh, to uh, listen to us and give some feedback to us. So we believe that uh, having uh, the opportunity to be interacted with the girls is one part, but also targeting at the pet, pet parents and teachers were uh, one of the good opportunities and also to be continued in order to help the girls to have a better image or, uh, or encourage them to, uh, to, stu to study and have interest in STEM areas. Okay, so this was the, the you can see the picture the, uh, for the parents and teachers session and uh, they were very happy to be connected with us and they really highlighted, uh, highly appreciated the NEA activities. Well, actually after uh, having the second workshop, I got an email messages, one of the, the parents, uh, to send me an email and then they they said it was a really really um, the important message is uh, opportunities and they they highly um, appreciate uh, the NEA activities and they wanted to see that this should be continued and then well very good comments so I was very uh, proud of having that messages from them. And the next uh, international uh, the mentoring workshop was held the last year in Avila, Spain. Uh, I know that many of you are not familiar with the city of Avila, but it's uh, two hours uh, away from Madrid. But why the Avila was chosen? Uh, the, the Spain is Catholic country, but Avila generated and uh, produced one the first female saint from that city, so like a Teresa Avila. So the Avila city is uh, very much proud of having the female saint from their country, so their city. So this actually the event was organized with women in nuclear in Spain, but actually the students were organized by Avila city mayor and we had an interaction and discussion with the Avila city. Um, the, the people and uh, they uh, actively supported idea and to encourage their uh, the gold students to uh, to be connected highly accomplished the female mentors and then uh, the this after the having this workshop another one okay you can see the a lot of pictures you see then all the ladies who are all the women in nuclear uh, the Spain people. And actually, I want to highlight that one of the lady, the left side, the Taylor um, from the EPRI. So EPRI supported this uh, event. So she came to this event from Washington. It was, I think, it was very uh, impressive because it was held in Spain, but uh, the uh, the EPRI in Washington so co-sponsored this event to be possible. So it's one of the, the idea we can think about. So the, the, the more worldwide activities uh, to be supported by the, the other countries like this and organizations, which is quite impressive. And the, what are key observations from these recent workshops? The first of all, as you know, that this, is, this was very valuable experience for high school students to have the chance to exchange views and interact with female mentors and listening to their own stories and how they overcome, uh, overcame their problems and how um, they could uh, move forward even uh, with a lot of the challenges and also cultural uh, the practices which were more favorable to men. 
but it was very good for good for uh, the students to be challenged by the female uh, mentors and then the, this kind of personal interaction was um, the, the very um, inspiring and also uh, very tailored so very small disc group discussion to be um, very highly interactive with the students was um, the well received by students and then it was exactly the what the, the, the this international mentoring concept was designed i we thought it was very successful and one of the point we uh, want to share with you was uh, the studying abroad especially through the student exchange programs it's, it's a worthwhile way to students to learn about differences and gaps and maximize the chances of studying uh, or succeeding in STEM areas. So one part, um, the gold students, especially in Asian countries, uh, they are very much influenced by their parents and teachers, even when they choose their own the career path. So um, being interacted not only with the, the male, also female mentors, but also other countries, uh, the girls, can be a good uh, momentum or driving force for them to be more um, to to have a wider view or perspective about their career, uh, career future. And the students may change their career path as a given point, but for this reason, the various pathways should be made uh, available to them. So, um, not in that sense, the our mentoring workshop not just focus on nuclear areas but more uh, the widely the science and engineering so first workshop we had astronaut so most of them are professors and physicists and doctors and of course the nuclear people so this well the one of the point but also I want to share with you is since it was held in Asian countries like in Japan uh, the female students very much concerned about um, their possibility, their future, if they can uh, maintain studying in any specific uh, the STEM areas and also uh, the maintaining their family life because they were very much uh, influenced by parents and then you have to continue this one and uh, you have to do this one. So they were actually debating over their career paths because the, once they have a more professional job, maybe it's, it's, it will be less possible to have their family, like having uh, the children or maintaining their family job can be challenging or not. Is that, that they, well, they, have that kind of concern even in their ages. So they had some question about this, even having the STEM areas or studying various professional areas, They this kind of uh, the profession can never be an obstacle for them to maintain their family life. And that's one of the points that we heard from Japanese uh, the government because uh, the, the nowadays the Japanese, the, the woman, uh, tend to marry very late and also even not um, having a child and this can be another the social uh, the problem. So in that sense we had uh, the very much focus on uh, the maintaining family life and even uh, all even through the all the female mentors uh, the, their personal life stories, it could possible and you can enjoy your family life and then you can enjoy your career path and then actually you can do whatever you want so that that could that such your uh, the positive message was uh, could continuously shared with them and that message were well received by them so for more information the brochure are available on the NEA website so please uh, visit NEA and then you can download this uh, the two mentoring workshops I'm sure you are very much interested in getting more information about our mentoring workshops and then uh, the coming the another upcoming mentoring workshop which will be held in August in Fukushima actually we are very much excited to have this workshop in Fukushima 
because uh, the, uh, there is more than just mentor workshop, but also very much um, the engaged with them to uh, in, encourage them to have very positivity in their work culture and also current status and also to looking at uh, the future, not really looking back on the past. So this time we are um, more focusing on the decommissioning uh, experts, which will be a very good opportunity for them to know also about the current status in Okushima. So this workshop will be held with uh, Japan uh, Nuclear Damage Compensation and Commissioning Facilitation Corporation in Japan. And another workshop we will have this year is in Russia in October 2 and 3. And this time we are not targeting at uh, the high school and junior school girls, but this time is uh, the female university students who are already studying in STEM areas. But we try to uh, provide them with more inf uh, the information, um, the, in particular, uh, in, to increase their um, awareness of future career path in nuclear sectors. So. Uh, the, uh, we have uh, already started our initial discussion with the Russia and how um, this topic will be organized because this is a, the, compared to other the previous mentor workshop, this will be more engaged and more um, um, focused on the nuclear sectors, showing the, the, uh, the uh, different uh, areas and then job uh, the, the description or varieties. So we believe that this will also uh, provide us with the more variety of mentoring workshops, which we are continuously uh, the first looking for. And uh, the, this is my last uh, the, the, the slide, but I'm also uh, um, interested in sharing this information with you, because not only for mentoring workshop targeting at the school goers, but also the, this is uh, NEA's uh, the policy to uh, the gender equality because our all meeting rooms here in NEA is named after the female scientists. Actually, this idea was <laughs> came from our DG Magut. So the main bigger room out downstairs are, of course, Madame Curie's name, the Madame Curie meeting room, and the other uh, the ladies' room that are named after like. A, Harriet Brooks from Canada and then Ellen Glendich. So I'm not going to tell, but you can see the different names, um, the, the female scientists. So every day we, when we have uh, the, the meeting and then we realize that, okay, we have to be very proud of having uh, the female scientists working and living together with in the NEA. So this is uh, my, uh, the, Yes, last slide. So I'm very happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you. Thank you very oh. much. Oh, here. by the way, Kapi, sorry. Uh, if video is available, actually, I provide, I, I'd like to share one minute video with you. So uh, this just wait, wait one second. So video will be. Uh, okay. The kinds of reasons that I hear that uh, preclude women from uh, or young girls from participating actively ranges anything from not being aware of what the opportunities are, um, the stereotype that exists for people in STEM, that it is for geeks, dweebs, uh, not really attractive personalities, um, that it is a male-dominated environment and they feel uncomfortable working in that. And probably more prevalent than all of that is a lack of role models. And so they don't see themselves in a STEM career. 
it's uh, frankly what the nation needs in order to maintain its uh, economic prosperity and competitiveness and innovation to have more women in STEM. I've long wanted to be a doctor and work with foreign news, but I couldn't imagine my future. So I came here to get advice for my future. I got to know one scientist. She was challenging her own goals. And the more I know about her, the more I feel that I want to be a woman just like her. She said that believe in yourself and you can do unbelievable things. I will challenge my goals and never give up. Thank you. Thank you very much, John He. I think it's great to hear about the mentoring program and we can learn a lot about this because there are many mentoring programs on the way in action and probably we, we should consolidate our actions there a bit to learn from each other and improve our individual mentoring programs. Um, we have now our last speaker and I look a little bit at the time uh, since we won't have too much time uh, left for questions. Chansey, now it's your uh, turn. Please uh, go ahead. Thank you, Dr. Voigt. Appreciate it. Good day, everyone. Um, being a nuclear advocate, I'm really honored to be part of this elite panel and speak about something I'm really passionate about. I'm really excited to be part of this. Um, based on the time, I will try to quickly make up some time. Um, so pretty much, uh, I've been part of the nuclear industry, working in nuclear power plants for the past 30 years in all different capacities. So this is really uh, something I'm really proud about and passionate about. Being part of the U.S. Wind organizations, we're coming up on our 20-year anniversary. Uh, so that's pretty exciting. Our organization, uh, we just went through a restructure. And to be more formalized, NEI used to run the um, the U.S. Win organization and conferences and part of the steering committee. So now uh, we are partnering with NEI as the industry for the steering committee. We have nine members from utilities, suppliers, labs, student, and of course NEI is our partner. Uh, one of the key things we did when we picked up this uh, new organizational structure and leadership for the U.S. Win organization, um, we developed an executive advisory committee. This is pretty powerful in that <clears throat> when we uh, went to the Nuclear Strategic Issues Advisory Committee, the NSIAC, and proposed this idea, U.S. Win, we want to have something that is going to be broader than uh, what we typically do during our conferences educating, talking about nuclear as a whole, different aspects, the future of nuclear and our advocacy um, and, and all of the different talents we have. One of the things we thought is let's get focused. Let's work on some areas that we really need to hone in on where U.S. win can make a huge impact. So one of the first things we did was to uh, create an executive advisory committee after the steering committee was formed. And that is made up of nine CNOs from the industry in the US. And interestingly, when we first went out and presented to the NSIAC, what we found were it was all men. So that was an eye opener for these council members to see, wow, at this level of CNOs and CEOs in the industry, there are no women, maybe like one or two, and it was, uh, we took a little bit of time trying to make sure that we could have a woman as part of that advisory council. 
Um, so one, it was really a win-win. From our side, we were able to engage these uh, leaders at the executive levels, awareness, visibility, and two, for them to really pull themselves in be and become the sponsors of US WIN. So it was a twofold, no pun on words, but it was a win-win situation on all sides. Since we've engaged them, it's been a year now um, that we've been working with the Executive Advisory Council and the power that it has and the impact that it has in the industry is we have more of these CNOs, senior leaders, SVPs, men attending our conferences, supporting back at their home industry at their plants to um, encourage more of the women to participate and take some on heavier roles. We have 77 chapters across the country. We have over 6,500 members. We have a great student program and the mentorship that we have that we start kick it off during our conferences, our annual conference is pairing up the professionals with students at the conference. So, which has been great. So then they become their personal mentor, even after they leave the conference, to be able to have conversations, career discussions, and to help them motivate and move forward in their career progression. So what we support, Nuclear mat Matters on Advocacy, uh, NAYGN, uh, American Nuclear Society, Nuclear Museum for Nuclear Science Week. We work with Girl Scouts across the country. And then we're also the gender champions in nuclear policy. And we took the panel pledge last year. A um, couple of the initiatives which we're really proud about is one, as I mentioned early on, about the steering committee restructure and including the advisory council of executives, senior leaders in the industry to make sure that they are actively participating in the growth of US WIN and to be able to help us with getting more women in management executive leadership roles. Um, second, another big thing we've taken on this year is an executive women's leadership program. What that is, is um, what we see is when, when engineers, students, professionals come out of college, Typically, it's a 50-50 split between women and men, but as they career, as they progress in their career from their um, maybe first line supervisor position, and then when they get to a leadership executive, we saw a big gap. So from that, we said we really need to target this area, and this is how US WIN can give back to the industry in supporting. So this program is a focused program we're going to the pilot will be kicking off July of 2019 during our national conference. It's a year-long program and it's focused on women and to make sure that we're closing that gap from a first-line supervisor or manager to an executive level. So these women that the CNOs and CEOs nominate to be part of the program, we want to make it a very coveted program when it's all said and done. Even though there are training programs and programs that are out there that are for both men and women, this is more targeted on the needs of women. There will be a part where the CNOs will engage, will participate to make sure we're closing the gender gap. So I'm really excited about this program and we're off to a great start with developing the program, designing the program and starting the kickoff with graduation targeted for uh, July of 2020 during the next national conference. So this conference is um, our 20th anniversary, as I mentioned, it will be held in Chicago um, and July 28th to the 31st and it's being hosted by Exelon. And our theme is 2020 vision for the future, I think very appropriate. Um, so I'll quickly um, wrap up here with a video that I have for you all as an inspiration. And oops, uh, hopefully this is gonna play. Um, Let's go tell people they'll only pay for what they need with Liberty Mutual. <laughs> Fine, I'll drive. Molly, can you please take out the trash?
have a new movement sequence going. Great. Let me show you. Please do. Yeah. I reprogrammed the robots to do the inspection. It's running much faster now. See? It's amazing, Molly. Ding, ding, ding. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I know I rushed through this thing, but I wanted to be mindful of the time of everybody. And thank you, Dr. Voigt. I'll open it up if you have questions. Hello, everybody. I'm really sorry, but we won't have time for an answer, uh, question and answer session anymore. But I'm sure that Jordan will uh, collect all the questions and uh, redirect them and that you will find answers to the questions you might have. So let me take now this option to thank all the presenters for their excellent contributions and how and their ideas how we can improve uh, the gender balance in the nuclear area. And with this, thank you also for our listeners worldwide and with this, I will give back to Jordan to wrap up the session. Thank you very much and goodbye. And any questions, please forward to Jordan. Hi, everyone. Uh, firstly, thank you again sincerely to all of our presenters. It was very great to hear from these individuals today. We will make sure to get all of the questions to the appropriate individuals. We want to thank our participants for submitting questions. Um, we very much appreciate your time, and we hope in return there were some valuable insights. I wanted to emphasize that for everyone who registered, a link will be sent out with the video attachment, so this video can be replayable and shareable among all your among all your networks. Uh, one mo once more, thank you again to all of our presenters, and please enjoy the rest of your day, and we hope to see you again at future NICE events. This concludes our webinar.